פסוק. So today I guess we really start with the methods in bioinformatics. So to yesterday we talked about quite overview of databases that are good to know that are and and in particularly for this type of course the important databases are are of course the sequence databases and also the structures of protein genes genomes databases. So Uniprot you should you should know what Uniprot is you should know what PDB is and we come back to PFAM. So some of the things we will are important to know, but then there are all the other data out there also. But a database is only useful if you actually can find things in it. And of course, as I said, we can have in, look up for keywords, we can find other mouse genes, but in many cases we want to find a, a relationship between sequences. As I said sometime in the beginning, if two sequences are similar, that indicates that they have a common ancestor, that also indicates that, they have, that the proteins have stru similar structures, and they might actually do similar functions. Uh, uh, so how do you know if two proteins are si similar? And that key thing here is really is alignment. So the word alignment. Oh, sorry. The word alignment is a very, very key concept in all my practice. And it means that we can relate two sequences to each other. You can say, you can say that position one in one sequence relates to position 52 in another sequence. So this is an alignment. This is two, two protein sequences. And you see that you have, they are, they're both, one is 116 residues long, one is 98. So you have two sequences that are just strings of letters. But if, if, if you have alignment, you say that the position 1 here, this y, is related to this y here. And the e is related to e. And then you have some, here you have some annotation alignments. So star means that they're identical, colon, I guess, means that they are similar, and dot means that they are less similar, I guess. So you can see in this case, large parts of these are similar. And a few key things you can look at here is that it's what you have here. You have gaps. So alignment is not that to take two sweeps and slide them on top of each other, but you actually have also gaps. So you can insert part of my residues in one, in one of the sequences. Or delete. I mean, search and delete, you, don't, you, you can't really say what happened. But this one is longer, and so this E is related to this M, and this C is related to this V, but it's asparagine here in the middle, it's not related to anything. It's a gap there. So the keys. The question here we often want to do is find the optimal alignment. So what is the best alignment given some criteria? And today we will learn how to do that. Uh, so and, and if we didn't have these gaps, it would be trivial. We would just take them and search them and try to find to optimi optimize it somehow. But uh, and uh, now these gaps complicate things. Still, this is not too time-consuming to find optimal alignment. You can find it in something which is the length of that sequence times the length of that sequence calculations using a method called dynamic programming. But it's uh, too slow to do it. If you want to do it, take one sequence and search every other sequence that is known today. Do it this way. <coughs> that, that you could do it some time ago, but now the sequence database, well, you can do it for one sequence, sure, but you can't do it all against all. Because that's, that's too much computational power, and it's, and it's a bit stupid also. Uh, so, why do we want to do it? One key th ca concept is to say homology. We will come back to that later when we discuss phylogeny, so we have evolution of pro genes and proteins in general, but homology means that two genes have a common ancestor, or two proteins have a common ancestor, two, 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 two things have a common ancestor. So it means that one supplement evolution at a time, they, had, they were the same. So if you want to study evolution, we need to do alignments. So you, can, you could have infer here that these tyrosines here, in the common ancestors of these two proteins, they, have, they were the same amino acid. So if you want to make it three of this, we want to see what happened. We can see that this one has been cons consistent all the time. 
while this one has changed in one way or in both. So to detect homologies, to detect what, what proteins are related to each other or what genes are related to each other, it's important. Or to study evolution, so what study how has evolution happened? Can we say has this gene evolved faster than another gene, etc.? We want to predict functions, so we want to actually uh, do. I mean, it's often assumed, it often, it often is the case that proteins that, that are homologous that also have also also have similar sequences and also have similar functions. It's not always the case, but it is the general that's the case. And as I said, when we, did, when we looked at these databases, is that most information in the databases is not obtained by experiments. It's actually detected by indirect evidence that someone has done an experiment with one protein, one gene, and then you infer it to another one. Because there are millions of sequences in the database, and we haven't studied them individually. And also, if you want to model 3D structures, if you want to have a 3D structure protein, we, as I said at the beginning, the 3D structure is very informative because it can tell you much about the functional protein. And the best way, the same thing, we don't have, we only have a 3D structure for about 100,000 proteins, and we have millions of them. But for many of these, we can actually make quite accurate models by using an alignment. So we can take, assuming basically that if we know the structure of one of these proteins, is that the part that is aligned is in the same place, more or less. Now we have to, have to fix the gaps and the differences. But that's another, another story later. So, there are some basic evolutionary concepts. So homologues homo have a common ancestor. This is often a misconception that people use these terms in the wrong way. They often um, uh, do not I mean, often say that ho you have high sequence similarity, they are similar and therefore they are, ho they are homologues. It's actually, that's certainly true in most cases, but that's not the definition. The definition of homology is that you have a common ancestor. And the common ancestor can be very, very ancient, so the similarity can be very, very low. And you might not even be able to detect it, so you might, you might have a lot of homologues that you are. Uh, that you don't know about, and at least in theory, you could think, about, on the other hand, that the proteins that are very similar but are not homologs. They have basically evolved to be very similar and have high sequence similarity, but from different from different uh, ancestors. So they have a convergence uh, evolution. That's most likely quite rare, and it's but it's uh, can exist, and it depends on how you define things. Probably. You also have a problem with that, that actually proteins can fuse and divide and things like that. And so you might have homology in some part of the protein, but not in other parts. That is, they, they complicate things. But that we'll let's leave that for the moment. But the, the definition of homology is really that you have a common ancestor and nothing else. So how do you get to homology? There are basically uh, two ways. You can have gene duplication, so basically you have within one organism, one gene can become two. And then they have these two genes are homologs. But it can also be a speciation, so once upon a time the common ancestor of man and chimpanzee was some kind of ape, and then the speciation happened, and now there are homologs between chimpanzee and ape, or mouse and man, or whatever. And as I said, homolog high sequence similarity indicates homology, but it's not a proof of it. And homologs have, in general, similar 3D structures. There are always exceptions. So basically, this is the speciation. So basically, if you look at three, so these three genes, A, B, and C, are all homologs. So let's say that this is uh, chimpanzee and this is human. So in the human, you have two copies of this gene, B and C, that are homologs because there was defecation in the human genome sometime, long time back. While in the chimpanzee, is only one copy. We will talk more about this in. Uh, next week, I guess, because these are often called orthologs, while these are called paralogs. And the idea is that somehow things that are related by speciation should be more functionally similar than things that are related by application. Because this could be a way for evolution to detect new functions, or use new functions. 
There are, of course, cases like of convergence evolution, that's the things that are not homologs, but have similar features. They're easy, they're, for instance, look at the uh, bats and the butterflies, they both have wings, but they have not the common ancestors. Well, they have a common ancestors a long time back to all animals, but the wings have not evolved from the common ancestors, they have evolved independently. We look at some of the eye systems also, things that have evolved uh, uh, completely independent. And it's not always, if we look at protein genes, it's not always cases, it's not obvious when you, ha when you have different cases. The cl classic examples are tin barrels, which are big barrels, so pro proteins would have a one beta sheet and one alpha helix from a big barrel. And many of these, they are, they are very common, and many of these have uh, functional sites of very different sites. So it's not, so that it would indicate they actually have evolved differently because they're really hard, very, very hard to take the analogy. On the other hand, you can actually find some sequence signals between them and even within them. So it's hard to define really if it was converted or, or, or not converted. So people can keep on discussing that. But for most practical purposes, we look at things that are more similar and then it's quite clear when, when there's a homology. It's hard to say when it's not homology. So what is an alignment? And what is a good alignment? We'll talk more about the good alignment on Monday. So today we'll more talk about what is an alignment. So these are four alignments. They're all between two, two diff between uh, two sequences. This sequence and that sequence. So these are two sequences. They're the same sequence in every case. And they're all uh, well, not really the same sequence in every case, but this is uh, a quite good alignment, you would guess, because 10 out of 12 positions are identical. <coughs> it's only is and at that are different, everything the same. But if you will have a mutation here to make so this is, is a sequence instead. And if you do the same alignment here at the beginning, you will get 4 out of 12, so only every third position would be identical. Which is by intuition, this is a much worse alignment than this one. And you can invent some scoring system, you can just count the number of identical positions, and this gets score 10, and this gets score 4, so this is better. So these are more homologous. On the other hand, if you allow some gaps, you can actually get 11 out of 12 positions, 11 out of 12 positions in this to be identical. So you have this is, is a sequence, and here you have the at sequence. But in somehow, if you would assume this was the original se pattern sequence and this mutation happened, this is not the correct alignment. Because this A here so, well, should uh, Uh, yeah, this A here, well, you, I mean, it doesn't really correlate, correlate to this A here, because this one existed before. Sequence is the same, and TH is the same, but this A is kind of just random, as you get one hit there, because you, ha you have introduced an A in both cases, both positions. And uh, so you, might, you maybe should have it not like that, you should maybe have uh, that and this and have an alignment is one that's identical if you would really try to reproduce what happened in evolution. But anyway, this would have a score of 11 in this case, which is quite good. On the other hand, it has got a lot of gaps, so you could imagine you would have liked to have some kind of cost for the gaps. So, but anyway, these are all alignments. We, we haven't, these are, we haven't deci decided which one is best. We haven't set up any rules at all. But these are all alignments. They're all valid alignments. We can have our idea which is best and which is worse. So in alignment, you, you can basically describe something like this. You can look at uh, what positions are related to each other, if they're identical, if they're different, or how similar they are, if they're insertions or deletions, if they're different here. Yeah, so you can, you can define alignment like that. So this is one good way to represent alignment. Another uh, very useful way to represent alignment is in a matrix. 
now things get slightly complicated. So you have to think about it. If you take one sequence in one direction like that, and one sequence like one like that, and you can then represent the alignment like this. So you can just think about this is now this is another sequence. This is Dorothy Hodgkin and Dorothy Crawford Hodgkin. I guess it's um, 50 years ago since the Nobel Prize, I guess, but that's another story. Uh, and you can think about a matrix here. So you can, for every pair of positions here, you can put out, you can, for instance, put, a, in this case, you put a letter, that letter, if they are identical, and nothing else in other cases. So, see, so Dorothy, all here, here. But yeah, so O's, you have an O here, 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 here. D's, you have there and there. R's, you have there and there, etc. So if you put a dot or a mark on every position that is identical, you get what is called a dot plot. Or if you put a dot, in this kind of part. So then you can think about you can trace an alignment like that. So that means that anything that is going along a diagonal means that these two positions match. Anything that is going horizontal or vertical means that there is an insertion or deletion in one of the sequences. Right. Vertical in one, horizontal in another one. So in this case, it will mean that D is aligned to D, O to O, R to R, etc., all the way to Y to Y or H to H. Now I guess Y Y here, and then you start having a lot of gaps in this sequence here, Crawford Hodgkin, and you will until you get H to match H, and then you go down all the way to Hodgkin. So this is an, this line here is identical to have the alignment something like this. Oh, the blow was better if you want to see it. I think. So, Dorothy. Dorothy aligned to Dorothy. And then uh, Crawford. And then you have Hodgkin. And you have gaps here all the way. So this alignment here in the matrix is identical to that alignment. It means the same thing. Do you all get it? Good. So that, that's fundamental. So because the alignment is what we use. Yes. What is about um, translation of the sequences? So I can just translate it. So that, that that we don't begin with Dorothy, but with I could start the, if I if I had uh, you mean something here, like that, or here and and then put the the Dorothy Hodgkin. I oh, mean I, 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 I scramble like that. Yeah. yeah. No, a, in most cases we do not allow that because that uh, so if I would have uh, well the easiest, easiest way would just make the sequence longer and add everything later. And I just look for it. So, that, so you say that I would have Dorothy over here, and then I could take Dorothy over here, like that. Then I could take it away. So what, what, what we do, which I will come to in a second, is that we actually look, we, we, are, we do two types of alignment. One, when we try to look, align the whole global sequences. So you try to then you really take this. You will start and end at the beginning. You might start with a gap, but end with a gap, but you, you, you align the whole thing. The other thing is we try to find the best local alignment, so the subsequence are similar, and then you can find it several times. So then you can find Dorothy here, uh, Hodgkin here, and Dorothy there. Then you, then you can translate it. But then this, um, the number, if you really would allow all the substitutions, that really breaks a lot of the lo uh, rules for, for finding optimal solutions. So that is much harder, and we don't really. Well, it happens in, in biology, but in these cases, this local alignment, finding the local match is what you do, and you, 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 then afterwards you can rearrange it. There are, it's probably not that rare, it happens, but it's uh, not in the standard search procedure. So that's, and it happens on a long evolutionary time scale, so it's kind of, you end up have problems to get good alignments. So, uh, look at this plot. So basically, 
what you can do is if you just make a dot plot. So this is actually probably what, what, actually what people did in the 70s, probably before my time even. So if you take this is a sequence, and this is a sequence, you can actually look at this kind of dot plots, and you can look at here, and you can actually see just by tracing by I that there are diagonals here that are good. Then it's a bit unclear what you should do with this region over here. But you can do the diagonals. And particularly if you would be a bit smart, if you don't just put every plot there, but you put actually only maybe mark the ones that have like five identical residues in a, in a diagonal. If you only put mark the diagonals, you can end up with things like this. So this is to actin and some other papers, so totally related. And if you just mark these identical positions, I guess oh, this is all identical positions, and I can't be all because I took a few, but they are filtered in some way so they have to be a certain length. You see very easily that they are these two proteins are very similar to each other because they have a lot of identical things along the diagonal. But in this region here it is a bit unclear, and you see there are some shifts here. So here there is some gap, exactly what the gap is. This you can discuss, but the, this part of the line here, and then this is a gap. So this is a bit long. This sequence over here is a bit longer than that one. And here is another essential gap. There's something up here also. It gets uh, if you have less similar proteins. Can, so this is a protein that is longer, this capital is longer, and then you see it ends over here, so this is some extra parts here, but you also see that there are some similarities actually over here, so there probably are some similar parts over there also. So this is, this is actually quite similar to the beginning. And if you get, ah, that's not a protein, and here you see so like a big gap in the middle, <coughs> this part is quite similar, and this part is quite similar, but something has been happening with one of the proteins in the beginning, there's been some, some insertion. So th this is actually, you can actually do this, well you can keep on doing this, and um, yeah, it's much harder to see it, it's something further away. And if you look at the real dot plots, they might look like that, and you can really find hard to find, find something, but you find something in the middle, if you, if you don't kill them. So, these dot plots are very... Uh, they are... Uh, Useful if things are very similar. You can see things very easy if things are similar, but they are as soon as things get a bit complicated, they are very hard by eye tracing it. But it's actually what we use, or something similar to that, that we use when we when we try to find an optimal alignment. So the idea is still is really there. We do and we actually do calculating every the value of everything you position here. This is why it takes m times m, so, so it's square number of length of sequences, calculations to do, because you need to calculate one value, or several values for each position here. So we have, as, I, as, as you asked for, we have two types of alignments, or there are more variation, but in general are two types of alignments, what we call the local and the global. So the local alignment tries to find, so these are the two same sequences, P, I, 3 kinase, and C, A, and P, protein kinase. So they probably are related. But in the local alignment, we try to find the best local match. We only look at things that are quite similar, but it can be short, it can be anywhere. So in this case, we find a region here of some 15 amino acids, so D, R, H, N, S, N, and D, L, K, P, S. This region over here, down in the local one. That align quite well and have quite a lot of similarity. They're not perfect, but there, there are three, four, five, six, seven out of almost half the residues are identical. If you do so, that so then we ignore everything before and after. That. So just that's the local alignment. You can find several local alignments, but this is the best local alignment you can find for these two sequences. On the other hand, if you do global alignment, you really want you should include both everything from both sequences. And you said in these cases, these two things are actually not matched together because they are moved around a bit. And you have a lot of gaps here, and you have an average, probably lower sequence identity, a fewer positions identical. Well, not fewer, but a lower fraction of positions are identical. But th so these are two types of alignment, and there is just a small modification of the algorithm that you can do to find both 
well, the one rather that we will discuss in a second. And, and, and in most cases, in biology, we actually want to use local alignments because we are, as I said, we can have large rearrangements of proteins. We can have parts that are added and merged together, and then a global alignment would not find it because you really, if you have one part of one protein that's similar to another part of another protein, and then one protein has something extra, the score, the, the, the score you would get that would be quite low if you you do a global alignment because you will have a large part that do not match because they're different lengths. But the local score can be very good. And the statistics are better local score. So in most cases, you want to do a local score. On the other hand, if you really want to find, you know that these proteins are more or less equal longs, so they have the same structure, something that is similar. So you want to find really better alignment, often the global alignment is better. So if things are basically, if things are more similar, if things are similar enough, you would basically get the same answer in both cases. But if, you, if they are for high similarity of global alignment, it's better. So another example of global local alignment is here. So you have here you have global. You see you have more more gaps in this one. Here you have here the local alignment basically have the gaps only at the end, so you ignore this part over here. So you have one gap there, one gap there, instead of having one, two, three, four gaps. And you have high see here you have F T A L. L, L, A, B. So basically, almost every, posi every position here is identical to something there, except this one that's aligned to gap. And but that here you have well, actually that's probably the case here also. Yeah. So, so yeah, the same thing. But there are more gaps here. As I said, this is this is if you look at real proteins, particularly in the higher eukaryotes and high uh, humans and animals and plants. They often consist of multiple domains. This is something we will discuss later also. So, but this is an illustration of related proteins that all have uh, protein kinase domain. And this is, this is just, so e each of these bars represent one protein and each color has one type of domain. So all these proteins down here, this are these four ones, have one, two, three, four, five domains. They're roughly the same length. And while well, this one is missing one domain, but that's probably just misassignment. So probably all these five have roughly the same length. So between these, you could probably do a global alignment and make it a global alignment, and it would match up quite nicely. At least if you use good algorithms and good good methods. But if you go up to the proteins on top here, they are see they are significantly longer, and particularly they have at the C terminal they have two X domains. They also have something X seems to be longer than the end terminal, but it's no, nothing that's assigned to be domains. So there might be something else. And there's also a big, 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 big larger variation of uh, the length of the area between the domains. So if you would align the, the short ones to the long ones using global alignment, you would get not very good scores because you would try to, really to match everything here and here. But if you use local alignment, you would align this part in the middle quite nicely if they're similar enough. So that's the reason of why, why, why you want to do uh, local alignment. Uh, so the key in alignment, as I said, is gaps. So if you do not uh, allow gaps, but only allow, so this is alignment of two proteins, bovine kinase and uh, CMP dependent kinase. So there are two kinases, so they are related, they do the same function, they are probably home, there are certain homologs. And if you were not, if you would try to get an alignment without any gaps, you will get the upper part here. And you will get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, uh, 16, 25, 27 identities. But if you allow some, uh, just a few gaps here and here, you see, well, big here then, but they had also, but there's a few small gaps, you will get an order, get an order of 45, 50 identities, so almost twice as many identities. Mm -hmm. And if you think that identities are good, which at least intuitively should be, that is much, the second one is much better alignment than the first one. So without gaps, 
you can't have a good alignment. And that, that also reflects, of course, how evolution happens. So, how what 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 can what, what can happen to a to a gene during evolution? Certainly, you can have a nucle nucleotide that changes the amino acid. That would be a mutation. So you would change something here from an uh, lysine to uh, arginine, or, uh, or to lysine to leucine in this case, actually. So you have a mutation, you change that something. You can have, uh, but you can also have insertions and deletions. So you basically, some part during uh, during uh, recombination of cell division, a part of the DNA can be lost, or you can have a part of it duplicated. So there are errors like that. And if that happens to be in the frame shift, I talked about the other day, so it happens in sort of factor three, the rest of the protein will not be affected. You will just lose or add a part of it. And if that is not completely destroying the protein, that can be accepted in evolution, so you can have insertions and deletions here. And you see, most of these are quite short, but they are, I mean, here at the end we can ignore it, but some are a bit longer, they have three residues. So the, the, there is, if you look at, look at it histor historically, from the other alignment, it's, it's, it's much more likely that you have an insertion deletion of three re residues than you have three or one. So like the first, so it, it's not always that you lose one at a time, you can actually lose several at one time, or add several at the same time. Some of these are just applications of part of the next winter set or so on, but in general, but these are, there are evolutionary reasons why you need to have these gaps, and why they look like that you do. So what is an optimal alignment? So now I talk about optimal. So first we want an alignment to reflect the evolutionary history of protein. But optimal is in this way is a computer, computer science benefit, so we want to have a score, basically a scoring function that says that the optimal alignment is the one with the highest score. But then we need to define what score we have and how we calculate the score. So we have Intuitively, we can go back to this this is a sequence on. This is quite good alignment, and this is third most likely the optimal alignment for these two sequences. Anything else we do to this will either have more gaps or have fewer identities. So you would assume that this is the optimal alignment. And in this case, you would assume that this is not optimal alignment, but this is something like this is the optimal alignment. You have 11 out of 12 positions, possible positions identical. But how, how do we know it and how much is the difference is? So the easy way, so uh, I, well you can have a scoring function that was just 10, 4, 11. In other cases we actually have what we call a substitution matrix. So basically we have for every pair of amino acids we have a specific sco score. The message, I mean, it's a Jew, it doesn't have a score. But. And, uh, so that mean, and the reason why we, ha we have it, and we'll come back to that later, is because some amino acids are more similar to each other. So it's, to change a leucine to an isoleucine is not very dramatic for protein, but if you change the leucine to an ar arginine, you change it much more. So that's some similarities are similar. Also, there are some amino acids that are more conserved, but if you have, you have the codons, we have three codons, so some are only have one, but some have f up to five, and then the probability of change these are of course higher for the ones that are more, or have fewer. So there are the so-called substitution matrices, I'll come back to them, and they are, uh, have different numbers. So in this case we just take one and get, get numbers. So if you take this, and here we have positive scores for most of them, they have minus one here. So you have a score of 52 here, here you have a score of 18, and here you have a score of 56. However, we are ignoring the gaps at the moment. Is that fair? And somehow, yes, intuitively, we would like to minimize the number of gaps. We don't want to have too many gaps. But you can always find almost a perfect match if you allow um, uh, many gaps. You can find high, quite high sequence so that you're allowing a lot taking the next one and similar in every pair. But uh, we, we don't want to have an alignment of that because we don't believe that that is how evolution occurred. 
And so we can have a positive gap. So in this case, you just put a minus one for every gap, for instance, and you, the score changes slightly. But this one doesn't have a gap, and this one doesn't have a gap, but this one has a lower score now. Okay, so basically, we need to get a score in alignment. We need some kind of score for finding every pair. And we need some kind of rule for how much a gap costs. And if we have this, we can take two sequences and ask which is the optimal alignment between these two sequences. And we also have to, have to define how we do with the ends, so basically do a local or global alignment. And there is an algorithm that is well known in computer science called dynamic programming that is guaranteed to find the optimal alignment of two sequences. And the idea is basically that uh, well, there are fundamental parts of this matrix here that we have. That we have like the, the, the gap matrix. Uh, we will go through this more, a bit more in detail later, or use those examples. But here, basically, if you uh, go back to your matrix here, is that you can get you can get this position in the matrix, so position i, j, in three different ways. You can, you can do it, come walk along the diagonal, which means that that i is aligned is aligned to j, and i minus one and j minus one are aligned to each other. So you have an alignment between the, these two pairs. Or you can come from one direction, from the up or from the side, and get here. And uh, then that means that you have a gap in one of the other of the sequences. So what you do in dynamic programming is that these three, if you know the values in these p three positions before, which if you start in one corner, the values are zero. But if you know the values of these three positions, a, b, uh, well, I, I minus one, j minus one, i minus one, j, i and j minus one. And then if you know if you come from here, if you come from the, along the diagonal, just add this score you have here, and you add the score of, of aligning these two positions to each other, these two residues to each other, you get a new score. If you come from i, j minus 1, you add the score cost of one gap, because that you make one gap more. Or if you come from the top, you also take the score that is in this position and add one more gap. Or add one gap. And if you take in these three scores, and take the maximum out of this and write it down in your, in your matrix position here. That is the optimi optimal value to get here. Then you can just continue doing this from, uh, well, here you can have different lengths of gaps, so you have to deal with that, but that's a detail. But if you keep on doing this for this position, and then you can do the next position, and you can do the next position. Uh, you can, then you can fill out the whole matrix. So, and if you do that, start in one corner and you fill out the whole matrix, then you just look at the maximum value you have in the bottom corner. If you do local alignment, you do slight variation of that. That is the score of my alignment. Then afterwards, you can trace your way back up for some of it. So I think we should do this perhaps after the break, so let's be back here at 11, and I go through this after the break. Okay, any questions? Everything crystal clear? So far, good. So next question is, is yeah, how do we get to this optimal alignment? So as I said, we need to fill out this matrix. So I'll go through an example here, and uh, we might do something on the whiteboard also if we have time. So this is two DNA sequences in this case. So we start by just putting zeros at the end, but outside the end. Let's just have something to start with, because if you align nothing to nothing, 
you can say assume that the optimal alignment is to align nothing to nothing, and that should have a score of zero. And in this case, uh, uh, we will fill out every position in this matrix. And starting in the top left corner. And the question is, what should we fill out here? We have a, so here we have three different ways we can get here. We can get the diagonal, that means aligning G to G. We can get from this side and having a gap. We can get from this side and have a gap. So we should basically try all possibilities. And we need to define the scoring function. And in this case, I guess we have a score that is basically one if they're identical. So, and we skip the gap. We don't have a gap cost, I think, if I remember correctly. So the best score we can get here is to put G turn on to G and have a score of one. So in each position M, I, J, in each position I, J, you have the maximum score, maximum out of these three different scores. So that's the score you had up here, plus the score you have to align this position. So that's an alignment, so you add a score there. So it's m i j minus, i minus one, j minus one, plus score of i j. Or you have a gap in sequence one, so the score of m i j minus one, plus some kind of penalty for this gap, or m i minus one comma j in the penalty for that gap, so going that way. And you should take the highest of these numbers, you should uh, write there. If you only care about the score of the uh, alignment, you do not need to do anything else. However, if you want to be able to find all the optimal alignment, you need to remember how you got there. You need to be able to trace back your way. So now we can fill out this row, this row over here. So what numbers do you think I should put here? Well, I have a, a sequence here in this case of G, and I want to align everything here. And the best way to get there is, can, I can never get the highest score than one, and I can always get the score of one if you have no cost for gaps. I can, I can always, in this position here, I can get from up here, which is a zero, plus aligning G to A, which gives a score of zero. I can get from here, from the upper part, and align, and have a gap, so it costs nothing, so A, A, one gap, another gap is zero. I can get to go from here, and make a gap in this sequence, and add a zero to this one, you get number one. So I can fill out ones all the way here. So I always use this blue position here. Well, in this position here, I actually could use either that, that one here, the red one, the GG, or I can use the blue one. They're identical, so I can't separate them, because they give the same scores. I mean, in both cases, I like one G to G, and I'll put the gaps around it. So in this case, I can just pick one of them according to some rule I set up, doesn't matter, the score will be the same. But why would you want to do that? I mean now, in order to get the one, you would have to like introduce a gap uh, after each, right? Yes, if I do a look alignment, if I, if, I, if I, so basically I can have the alignment of G, A, A, T, 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 C, G, T, T, A, I can have a G with other gaps, or I can have a lot of gaps, and G here and other gaps. And well, none of them makes sense at all, so it doesn't really matter, but from a, from a scoring point of view, if I have no cause for gaps, they're identical. If I would put up some rule for gaps, they might not be identical. Yeah. But if, as long as I don't have that, they're identical. Because normally we have a penalty for gaps. Yes. At the moment we do not do that. So that's just, for a computation point of view, they're identical. They have the same cost. I mean, they don't make sense anyhow. I don't know if you have one, one position. And it might, later it might turn out the one is better than the other one. 
we'll see you add up things later. And of course, you can fill out also this the uh, vertical row also with ones. And then you can keep on doing this. In this example, like we do here. So what what should I put here? Do you have an idea of the number? I can start the corner here at least. Otherwise, it gets too much. E A A T T, for instance. And then I had uh, E G A T. So at the moment we have started with zeros everywhere, the corners. And put the one here, and put the ones all the way here, and the ones all the way there. So what should I put here in this um, uh, GA position? So I have three different ways I can get there. I can go this way, this way, and this way. Could use the blue one, it looks better. Switch is the best way to get there. What, what, what score do I get to line G to A in this case? Yeah. Zero. And uh, the score, so, so I can, if, I, if I put that one, I have one plus zero builds one. If I go for this to this, I also get one. And for that, I also get one. So I should put a one here. And uh, see what, which direction they do it here. Okay, they, go, they go down here, like in this direction. So if I go down here, so the third position there and the second one there. Okay. Any votes for scores or votes for zero? Two. Two. And because I can get from this one, I get the score for A to A, I can put the two there. And here? One. Mm, there are three ways to get here. Two, because I can get from upper top and go down there and get two. And then I can keep on going down there, and that's what they do in this slide over here. So I get one, two, 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 two. And I can keep on doing that for the next row also. In this case, I guess it would be a one here, here, Sorry. I have three different ways of getting there. If I come from the top, I get the A, I, have, I get, I should have this one plus the console gap, which is one. If I go from this one, I should have this plus the cost of the line, uh, identity, which is one. So the one plus one is two. If I move this one, I can also get two. So I can get two here. Because if you think about alignment of this one, you have G, A, A aligned to G, G, A. So I, I, I can get this, this is called a two, but I can also do an alignment of G, Gap A A to G G A, for instance, and all the score two. So two different ways to get the same same score. If I don't if I don't include the causal gaps. So that's why I think of both cuts from up here and down there, diagonal or horizontal. So I can fill it out here, and if you actually get down to this corner over here, you will have in the bottom one. What would you get there? You have here a score of two, and you have an A there, and an A there, that means that you should put the three. So you can do that, and you keep on doing it, the three, and you can keep on just continuing doing it here. So you can, here you can get, you should put two here, here I guess you still put the two, or okay, one, you guess you put two here, I guess you guys should put a three here. Maybe you should see two. Well, I guess you should look at, look at that. So you can fill out the whole matrix like that. 
and you get down to the bottom corner, you have a score of 6. So the score of the aligning this one to that one is 6. These are 6 identical positions. So the 6 out of 7 possible one. Right? The shorter sequence is 7, that's just long. And uh, there are actually proofs that this is the optimal score you can get. So you, that this, you can, for, this will find it. But now if we want to find the alignment, we have to trace our way back. We have to somehow remember how we got there. We can calculate it, but if it, the best is that you just for every position here remembers it. So you start with the six down here. How do you get here? Well, the only way to get there was because you got from this one here. So you have a five. So you can take away all these parts. So how do you get to this five? Hmm. You can get to five. You can get to from not from here because this G and T didn't match each other. So you have must have got from this position here. You can take that one away, and the same against one more time, and uh, then for this five here, you could have got to from here, I guess, because this is G. No, this one five here is a G G, so you can get you can get it from here, like that. So now we have an alignment here. There, this, 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 and you can keep on doing this. Trace your way back. And now you have an alignment. This one starts popping up. Mm -hmm. right, now we have an alignment actually. So this means that this matrix here corresponds to alignment of you have G, A, T, T, C, A, G, T, T, A. And we start aligning the G to G, and the G to the A, and then an A to an A. No, no then, uh, oh, it was another A, yeah, sorry. Another A. Uh, and then you have a T here, and then you have a gap. So you have a gap, and then you have a C that is aligned to a C. Oh, this is a C, sorry. And to C, and a gap, and then a G, and then two gaps, and then an A. So basically, here, the four, four, the three of this one is the same, this one is not the same, this is 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 the same. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Positions are identical and the score is six. So the alignment looks like that. So you have one, two, three, four gap positions also. So you can actually write this uh, in some kind of computer code. Well, this is more like C or something like that. But basically, if you start with start with the loop, the, the length of one sequence, and you do a loop of that, and length of other sequence, and in uh, but you start putting a lot of zeros in the beginning you know, in there, and then you go through the whole matrix. So you loop one uh, like one of them, and then the other one. And you calculate the scores, the match, the leap insert stage, and then you take the score of this one is the max of these three values. So it's not to actually do this, this whole pro programming is not that many lines of code. But you need to define some inputs and things like that, and uh, you have to define uh, what the score function is, etc. Like that. But that's that's small details. But basically, the programming is ten lines of code. And the trace back is just slightly longer, but you can basically do here a lot of if statements. If, if this is this, you do this, and then you find your way back all the way. <laughs> oh. 
Okay. So this is quite similar. As but I said, this is just calculating the score like that. And I said actually, one important factor that we do align in biology is that we use substitution matrices. So we do not score every pair on only on identity. We don't say that they get a score of one if it's identical to zero if not. You can do that, but it's not a very good model. And the reason is because some amino acids are, I mean, it's an okay model for DNA. It's not perfect, but it works sort of for DNA RNA. But for proteins, it's certainly not optimal. So we use scoring matrices, and I will discuss a little bit where we get them from. <coughs> so the idea is, of course, basically what we use it for is that we have, when we align an A to an A or an A to G, we have a, we put a score. It's not just zero to one. You can put some number, and that number should be somehow reflects how likely these are to mutate from each one in, from one other to another. Uh, and the best way to get that is of course to look at alignments. For the problem is we need to have alignments to get optimal alignments, but you can get you can look at alignments see how common things are. But you can actually do it from other parts. You can look at physical chemistry, physical chemical similarities between amino acids. So like it's more likely to change the hydrophobic amino acid to a hydrophobic amino acid. Or you can also look at the codon usage, because there are the number of codons you need to change to go from one amino acid to another one. It's also an indication to how similar they are. So if you have an alignment, or particularly if you have multiple alignments, so this is you can have here, you can just calculate if you have no gaps. So if the similar sequences are similar enough, you have basically no gaps. You can get an obvious clear it's easy to make alignment. And then you can just calculate in the tree how many changes has happened, and you can just count basically how often you can see and see the change on A or A to a D, etc. etc. Uh, so, the, 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 so the first one, the, the most substantial matrix come for this kind of data, and you can count it. And um, what well, what you do there is basically that you like this. I skip that for a moment. Uh, you can basically if you just uh, take what you call the log odds ratio. So you basically Ha observe how, what it was frequency you see a mutation of a certain type, and then you basically take what is expected frequency, so basically how common are these two amino acids to each other. So, you, of course, if you, uh, or if, if all amino acids are equal common, the expected frequency to see this would be 0.5% square, but they are not all amino acids are not equally common, so that's not really correct. So, basically, if you, s so b and the reason we do a log. Here is basically because that gives you. I mean, if this is expected, exactly what is expected, log of one, log of one is zero. So you have that is more, not more common expected, not less common expected. But if it's more common expected, you have a positive value. And uh, if it's um, uh, less common, you have a negative value. And that means that you, in, a, in a substitution matrix, you can just add these values together. And particularly in old days, you could you could think about you could do this in in, in probability space, but you have numbers that were, were what is probability for this change. Just, but then you have to multiply these numbers together. So now if you have a, whatever score, you just have to have, to have the log odds is a very convenient way to do it. And particularly in old computers, the the calculation of floating points is much slower than, than integers. So basically, you, you turn this into integer numbers, and then you should basically make this log odds ratio. You have a range of between zero and twenty, or, or minus twenty plus twenty, minus ten and plus ten, and that works quite well. And you could do very, very fast calculations. Today, you could, in theory, do it by using the exponential least step, but that's that, there's no real advantage. So basically, of course, the most common mutation you observe is no mutation. So basically, how often is the, uh, is the I amino mean, acid not changed? So that will often have a very positive value, and then you will have a very uh, ne uh, 
everything else will have a negative value. So the original method, one is, 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 is called PAM method. So pa the PAM matrices is, is, is something that is based on this, basically. So what they did is that they made the number alignment and they just calculated these numbers. However, as I said, you, you need to have an alignment to calculate this, and you want to use it to make an alignment, so it's not really obvious how to do this best way. So what it started with is basically that you started with very high single identity. So PAM actually stands for point accepted mutation. So you have, you have one muta PAM1 means you have one mut mutation per 100 amino acids. So PAM matrix of one uh, oh sorry, wrong way. is uh, calculated. So PAM1 matrix is calculated from uh, substitution matrix from, from alignments where there's on average one mutation per 100 residues. And then you can actually take this matrix and if you do it in the probability space, you can multiply it by itself. So you can get the PAM2 matrix, which is just the square of the PAM1 matrix. Because basically if you have the probability, and then you can keep on doing that. Uh, you can go to the PAM4 matrix, and the PAM16 uh, matrix, and the PAM64 matrix, and PAM250 matrix. So you have different matrices that are more and more distant from each other. So basically what you do is you take your probability, you have the mutation frequency, so in PAM1, this is equal to zero. So some of these is basically 1% one, 1 mutations. This is the mutation frequency of the sum of all and everything. And then you will get a matrix that looks something like that. That is, looks, so, if you look, so this is all the 20 amino acids. And uh, you can see here, so they are sorted in some kind of uh, space of similarity of the, of the amino acids. You look at the diagonal, so that, that's exchange, aligning something to itself, uh, one amino acid type to itself. And uh, that is uh, done by, uh, uh, so that, then you get the score, which is always positive, but you see it's not the same. Because some amino acids are more conserved than others. So if you, if you get tryptophan in this case, it's very high. So it has a, a score of 11. While, for instance, uh, uh, valine and leucine is not so conserved. There are more mutations there. So that's one thing you observe. The other thing you observe is that every substitution, most of them are negative or zero. So replacing one amino acid with something else is bad. While there are, but there are some, some parts that are similar, you for instance have this cluster here of uh, hydrophobic or small hydrophobic amino acid, isoleucine, leucine, valine, methionine, that actually have positive values to replace each other. And also some of the aromatic has positive values and some of the charged ones have positive values and things, and things like that. So the, there are a few substitutions that actually still give a positive score. So, there are, so, so the PAM matrix are still used quite frequently, and they are they were developed in the 70s. The competitor was the Blossom. It is made in a similar idea, but slightly different. So the idea here is actually that they come from a database of blocks of alignments. So you had not single sequence alignment, but you had actually blocks of alignments, then you had multiple sequence alignments, and you, then you can calculate the, sub, the substitution matrix in a similar way, but you don't you don't do this multiplication of the matrices. Instead, you have blocks. You have partial alignments, blocks there that have on average the 40 percent, or 50 percent, or 60 percent sequence similarity, and then you calculate these matrices from that. So there are uh, so in, in some rough estimates is that the PAM 250 is blocks 45, PAM 100 is blocks 90. So so more or less similar. 
And you say this matrix is kind of similar, but not identical. I mean, the idea is of course you have positive values all along the diagonal still. The numbers are slightly different. This is trying to be more conserved. It's a high number, but uh, this number is a bit low. You see that there are a bit more of these positive numbers on the diagonal. So there are actually more sort of solutions that can be allowed. So again, uh, this is this data comes from observation of a bit more distant sequence alignments that are then just observed. The other one comes from observation of very close sequence, uh, sequences and then are multiplied by each other many times. So you get slightly different patterns. And this probably, this probably reflects more the physical chemical selective pressure that is acting on uh, 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 on, the, on the amino acids. But it was the trend is very similar, and the performance-wise, they are rather similar. I mean, sometimes some of those matrix works better, but it's not so easy to test. See, the cysteine here is very high, for instance. I don't think it was that high in PAM. But you will in the lab today or tomorrow, you will try a bit different, different matrix. In most cases, if it's put similar enough, it doesn't matter. But if they are, they are always borderline cases. So some differences here. PAM matrices are based on a particular evolutionary model. Uh, Blossom are based on uh, the slightly different methods of counter replacements. Important thing to know is that actually that the numbering is different. So a high number in PAM is a low number in Blossom. So in PAM it means the number of mutation per 100 amino acids. In Blossom it means the sequence identity of the data used for it. And there are, of course, you can do this for nucleotides also. You can have, this is the original PAM matrix and you can turn it into scores. In general, you see that these scores are not that far away from having one. We have hundreds in the diagonal and minus, minus one and everything else. But you see there are, it, purines and pyrimidines are easy to substitute. So you have LC, it's much better to replace it by T than by A and G. And also you see that the C and G are more conserved than the uh, A and Gs. The high score death. But are, in general, these are not that far away from being just the density matrices. Okay, so now we have an alignment. We know how to get an optimal alignment, in one way at least. We know what it, somehow idea how to get to this cost of substitutions. So now we have to deal with the gaps. As Therese said, we need to have a cost of the gap, because that's otherwise this alignment doesn't look very good actually, it has a lot of gaps. So what we normally do is just to assign two costs for every gap. We have a gap opening cost. So that's how much it costs to open up one gap. And then it does have a lower cost for making it longer. And this is not really good uh, fundamental reason for it. It's just that's the way that we observe gaps in uh, throughout the evolution. They are much more common. I mean, to have one big, slightly bigger gap than have many small gaps. So if you will, if you will not have it, you will get a lot of small gaps. But if you have this kind of role, you have a lot of big gaps. So in uh, uh, so in uh, this case, instead of having a score of six. Let's assume that we have a score of uh, minus 2 for opening gap and minus 1 for extending it. So then the score will be, still assume only 1, 0. We have a score of 1, 0, 1, 1, minus 2, 1, minus 1, uh, 1, no, minus 2 here, sorry, minus 2, minus 1, 1. So it will be 3, 1, 4, 2, 3, I think it's probably 1 at least, for this alignment. 
take it. So every time we open a new gap, we have a score of minus 2. Every position we make it longer, we add a minus 1. Often we have about minus 10 and minus 1 in these cases, but that's but the, the idea is the same. So this is how we deal with gaps. There are other ideas you can deal with. You can have some exponential functions that, but this is a good thing because it's very easy to implement in the dynamic programming. If you go back to our not the dot plots, but this slide, you see that we can basically, this in the dynamic programming algorithm, what we need to know about is basically, we have a score here, we need to know where we started from, or how far back back was. We need to have the cost of this plus the opening cost plus an extent. If it, so if we, are, if we come from here and there's a new gap, so if we come that direction, we need to have the gap opening cost. But if we come from this direction, we just need to add the gap extension cost of it. So when we calculate this in our matrix, let's try to do that. I'm going to go back here to our example. G <coughs> GATC. That's not. Stronger. Let's keep the rest of it. Oh, it's too big. If we do this, here is still point one, but then to get the next position, we would we would need to have a gap. So then the score here would be getting there plus a gap. Then we have a score of minus one, and then we make the gap one longer. We have minus two, minus three. And then to get here, we can get from uh, here and have a, uh, we actually need to have a cost of gap there, so it will probably be minus one here, I guess. And get here, we will still have one, because this is still no gap there. And here we have minus two, minus three, I guess. Etc. And then we can do it for this A here, we have to open a gap, to get from there or there. If we have minus one, I guess. And then we have minus two, minus three here. But this was minus two, minus three, minus four. And then to get down here, we have an AA, so we get probably get two. And then we here we have probably minus one, minus two. And here to get there, we probably can get it's T actually, isn't it? So that would get three. So in this case, we, the optimal alignment would probably be, and then we got down here, we got minus two, so we get one, because we got the area of the open line. So we would have a, probably, an optimal, probably an optimal alignment that would be like this, aligned to G, G, A, T, gap. So the score will be one, uh, zero, one, one, minus two, which is equal to one. So you would have to modify it to have the gap there, but it's, it's just it doesn't cost anything extra computationally. You just have to remember what you do. Okay, no, sorry. Uh, yeah. Now, the final thing we need to discuss is how to do local and global alignment. So we have this local and global alignment, and they're different. In the local, we want to find the best sub way, another one, we will not. We want to find the whole alignment. 
And this is actually very, very simple because Google Admit is something that's all called Nibel and Wunsch because it was the first people who uh, wrote the algorithm. So this is what we've done so far. So we can start here, we have a gap cost all the way. So here you see in the first line here you have minus 12. So this will be an opening cost of 12 and therefore minus 12 is 16. And then you have a match score and you can find alignment here and you actually score minus 5 at the bottom, so it's a negative score. But you have MM get the score of 6, etc. And you have two different ways of getting there and you can get, but this is most of it is a negative numbers. The local alignment is also of course Pete Waterman, because that's the people that made it first time. And it's a very simple algorithm. You just replace all negative numbers with a zero. And it is a, there are some assumptions here. There are some assumptions that, that the average score in the substitution social matrix should be less than zero, etc. So on. But in, but if you have but in substitution social matrices that we use, it works excellent. Basically, if you replace every number in this matrix with zero, and then you do the same algorithm, but you always replace it. If you, if you get a negative number, you put a zero instead. You know, then you basically ignore all the costs of a gap in the beginning and the end. You only have, I mean, it can still be cost if you have a big positive number and you get a gap opening, or a substitution is bad. You can still have it, but you have... Uh, uh, but you only keep it for the part that is important. So instead of having an alignment that looks something like this, we align M, G, S, I guess in this case you have an alignment that doesn't really make sense. You find a small subset here. So you have a lot of zeros. Here and there you, you have some similarities as a zero next one. But here there is a diagonal, S, D, R, T, which is actually identical to this S, D, R, T here. The only difference is that this is in the middle sequence here and this is the end. So this is a local alignment to find these four letters that are identical to this one. And this, this gives a score of 15. So the score of 15 in this case means that I mean, th that's the highest score. So then you can't look for the score down in the bottom corner, you have to look for the highest score you ever achieve. Because you, if you're going to do the bottom corner, you see that the score decreases. Because then you need to con co take into account the cost for the gaps at the end that you don't, don't want to do. So this here alignment, this SDRT, is actually the local optimal alignment. And as I said, this is mostly what we use in bioinformatics today. But there are some other different alignment types. For instance, uh, uh, question? Oh. Do you ever combine them? Let's say that the, the way we did it on the board, and then we get a really long extended gap. And do you ever then have the program do a local alignment on that gap with known, for example, viral sequences or... Um, you probably would do two local alignments. Because it, it's hard to find a good gap cost for that part in the middle. And how do you define it? It's, it gets, but, but if you do local alignment, you would find both. So that's what you would do. So you have a big insertion, basically, a big deletion one thing, because that's what you would, would do. Uh, there are cases where you actually, I, I, I mentioned, where you can do local in one sequence and global in another one. So, for instance, if you have a database of domains, that you know that these are entire domains of proteins, so they are never really cut in parts of it. Or, but your protein sequence which I might have many different domains. You don't want to do a local alignment just on the on the domain. You don't want to find half the domain. You want to find the entire one. So then you do a global over that one, but you but local in the other dimensions. So that, that fixes you. It, it doesn't really matter that much I think in practice, but there are, there are, you can do things for that. You can play around with it. So this is actually uh, Some different ways of doing this. So I guess this is uh, right. So this is this. So sequence is this line is aligned. And my guess is this is if you do global alignment, it's given some certain score matrix. It was in the book. You get score minus four. If you if you have um, This is what the difference was here. This, this is if you change the gap penalty, if you have a lower gap penalty, you can get another alignment that looks like that. If you walk down here, and it will be something. You can skip here, more gaps, 
and you get the highest score. And low gap penalty should always give a higher score or equally. I mean, that's where you lose the scores. But it's still a global alignment, but it is another gap penalty. So this is really, I don't know, is it better or worse? I mean, it's a different alignment. I mean, total score is higher, but that's because you have another model, so it doesn't really mean anything. You can actually look at the uh, local alignment that is there, and then you put it all zeros, and you see that you find another alignment again. It's probably a slightly similar one before, but it, it ignores the beginning that it was a similar, and this is have a higher score. And you can do a global, local alignment with lower gap penalty, you get again slightly different alignments. So you can see that the changes of gap penalties in particular, but also scoring functions actually will affect your alignment. And uh, so that's what we would do in the lab, we would play around with it. Of course, in most cases when we use this, someone has optimized this. So you really try what is the best gap score or gap opening. Particularly gap, there's, there's no fundamental law what, what the best gap opening costs are. So the, the, the ideal should be ideal for the different for different proteins, etc. And uh, that's actually what we do when we do hit the market models that we will talk about later. So I just to kind of remind them about the domain proteins, that how you do, 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 do this in the best way. So one way here could be to have a database that you have, it's PFAM, which is one entry for each domain type here. So basically what you do is you have a, a sequence for each here, you have actually multiple sequence alignment, but it doesn't matter. And then you take your test sequence here and you align it against all known domain and you will find brown match brown, blue match blue, red match red, red yellow match yellow, etc. So then you know what domains you have. And then it will tell you what proteins you have. Uh, but that's for next week, more how we do this. Okay, so tomorrow the, we will talk, or oh, not tomorrow, but Monday actually. We will talk about uh, two things. First, this is actually, it's not that slow, but you, but you think, you compare two sequences, if there are 100 by 100, that's 10,000 comparisons times factor 3 or something like that. So it's 10,000 calculations, that's nothing for a computer today. But if you, have, if you compare 100 against 10 million sequences, and you do 10,000 calculations for every thick, for every member there, then you will have uh, 10,000 times 10 million, which is 100 billion calculations, which is still doable, but it will take you a few minutes at least. So if you really want to search, it probably will take much more than that, because it's a bit slower. If you really want to search whole database, which we with one of these algorithms, which with Waterman, it will take probably in the order of a couple of hours at least. And uh, the problem is actually that because the databases are growing faster than, than, the, than the computer speed, it's slower to do today than it was five years ago. Because just the database is so much bigger. And particularly if you would like to do, compare all sequences against all sequences, which you sometimes want to do. Then of course you get it's basically impossible to do that today. I remember that people did that using Smith Waterman sometime in the 90s. And they, did, they had a big class doing that. I thought it was extremely stupid. Because there are ways to speed this up. One thing you can think about when you do this matrix is that we actually don't, we don't want to spend time on calculating uh, Uh, matches between proteins are not related. Most, if you take all pattern proteins, most of them are not related. Most of the, most of the sequences in the database are not related to your protein. So if you can get rid of 99% of data very, very fast, that would speed up things a lot. And the same thing in the matrix, you're basically only interested in the diagonals. If you can ignore the parts that are not in the diagonals or, or, or in one diagonal somewhere, that will also speed up the calculations a lot. So we'll talk about how to do that on Monday using BLAST. Or fast day, that's two different methods. Blast is the common one. And then the other thing we talk about is actually 
when you search a database, if you do a disalignment against every position and every, every sequence in the database, when you, you get a number, 1, 11, 25, 56, what does it mean? When is it really uh, significant? So when is this hit not just a random number? The number doesn't mean anything. So you want to have a probability that this is random. You might want to have a number that actually tells you that this is uh, significant. And particularly, just imagine that you have a longer sequence that makes it more likely uh, to find something by random in the database because that's because it's longer. So that you want to. So you have to take it length into account. So we'll talk about that on Monday. So. Questions? What was ONM an abbreviation? So NMM is just the length of uh, the two sequences, M plus M, so common. Yeah. Anything else?